happy to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, and, and the slide title is Pure, Procure and Implement Ah. And a lot of uh, IT projects start off that way with the notion of we have to procure and implement something, uh, especially ones that involve uh, COTS uh, software, off, commercial off the shelf. And it, it really it rarely ever ends up as uh, just being an IT project. There's a lot more components to it. Although starting out, they tend to focus on the technology, they tend to focus on their methods and approaches, uh, and there's very little uh, given to the notion of business value, uh, despite the fact that organizations exist to create value. So what I'll do, uh, there's a reference to the case study. This is based on a case study uh, for a client that I had a number of years ago. Uh, so although it was a number of years ago, I think a lot of the stories are still relevant and valid. And actually some of the things that we've heard already touch on uh, quite a few of the things that I'm gonna reference as well. Uh, so the context is that it was a Crown Corporation uh, here in Ottawa, they're, you know, sort of a mid-size, about 1,200 employees. Um, a lot of their employees were getting transferred to embassies around the world. They used to do all their training in-house, uh, and all their training content was focused on their own products and services. So the context of the project in this case was to procure and implement a learning management system. So they hired me to lead both the technology and the business side of the project. And uh, why that proved to be uh, a good thing was because I could start to soften the focus on the technology and the methods and approaches and start focusing a lot more on the business value side of it. Although that wasn't uh, necessary an easy thing to have accomplished. Um, so Stuart mentioned uh, about why lawyers uh, you know, are conservative and, and they like to use things that already exist that, that have been proven and so on. This was no different. So about three years prior, another Crown Corp had gone out to purchase a learning management system. They already had a 246 page RFP that they had in front of them that this uh, corp had used. But the issue was it was down to things like, and this is where it gets into specifying the nitty gritty of things like must be able to log on. Now, while the, the, this started three years prior, the contract had been awarded 18 months prior to my arrival uh, with this Crown Corp, and they'd still not implemented when we started. So here was the issue. We only had 18 months. We only had two and a half million dollars and one million was actually allocated to the procurement of the learning management system itself. Uh, so to Alan's point, fixed scope, fixed cost, uh, fixed time, or so they thought. Um, so day three, they said we're doing agile and specifically scrum. So they got us all in the room and they taught us how to do scrum. So that meant we had to use Scrum to do the procurement. The trouble was, this was uh, like 2009, 2010. So as far as we knew, this had never been done before. Uh, so, you know, we went to see the, uh, the Scrum coaches they had on site, which had uh, given us the one day uh, intro and said, hey guys, what do we do? And they go, well, yeah, we don't do chocolate. Uh, the Scrum is only for software development and they really didn't see how it would apply to procurement. Uh, so that was a bit of an issue. So then we had a few more plot twists. The enterprise architecture side of things, technology standards, uh, you know, so how did they come up with the $1 million price tag? Well, they had a preferred vendor in mind. Uh, they also looked at industry trends and things like that. So all the usual things that before you even get started, start to constrain uh, what you can do and how you're gonna do it. So the typical procurement story is that we start, look, they look at all these things and they look at their existing system, they, they look at this RFP that's already out there, they, they look at the product that they really want uh, and they come up with an RFP because after all, there is only one right choice that they're going to make and off they go to implement. Now the trouble with this is that what we end up with is the solution, which they've now defined, is the definition of the problem. So can we avoid that same old story? So what if we design the business problem by asking the right questions? So there's something called the hierarchy of powerful questions and goes from the least to the most powerful here. And obviously the most powerful question is why is because it's an open-ended question. So things like, well, why does it matter to our customers or client? Why does it matter to the org? Why does it matter to me? Uh, and so on. 
So maybe the main characters can write the story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a, a little analogy from where I'm from. So up here, uh, hockey is big. And so for a lot of parents, uh, you know, getting up at 6 a.m. or being at the rink rather at 6 a.m. in the dead of winter uh, so our kids can learn to play hockey. So why do we do this? Well, along the way, we start doing, uh, you know, get teaching, taking them to additional uh, things to learn different skills like uh, power skating, uh, stick handling, backward skating, and so on. And sort of the epitome for an individual player who makes it all to the professional level in the NHL is to get an interview on Hockey Night in Canada on a Saturday night and get the Hockey Night in Canada towel around their neck. There's actually a bit of a thing about that with the pro players. But the real why is because they want to win a Stanley Cup. So believe it or not, all the way back into initiation hockey when they're five and six years old, this is the thought process that they have. So all this other stuff they do along the way is because they have an ultimate goal in mind, which is to get to the pro level and win a Stanley Cup. So to every story, there's a moral. And when we have a higher purpose, it gets a lot easier to make better choices. And when we bring it back to sort of procurement and running our projects, it's we make better choices in what, how, when, and where. And so which way do we go in our story? Well, you start with saying, well, why do you need an LMS? So as I mentioned, it was a geographically dispersed organization. They couldn't bring people in and so on. Well, does that mean your existing training content can be put online as is? Well, no, we have to redesign it. So how do you do that? When, you know, well, we'll probably need new tools. Well, why do you think you need new tools? Because online delivery requires more different content and so on. And so on the questions go. So the more questions you ask, it sort of leads to more questions. And as you kind of read through these, and, and the slides will be uh, provided later, uh, you start to realize that a new story was emerging. And it wasn't about procuring and implementing an LMS anymore. And the other thing that became obvious was that most projects really are a portfolio masquerading as a project. So if a new story is emerging, then why do we assume our existing old story enables processes, roles, uh, new story enablers rather like processes, roles, or structures, and so on, will remain the same after we write the new one? And this is the part that's often forgotten. So when they say we're going to go off and procure and implement something with the focus on the technology and not focusing on, you know, why are we doing this, uh, then we don't get into these nuances of, well, you know, does everything we currently do and how we do it stay the same as well? And a lot of time there's a lot of assumption that that's actually true. So how do we go about structuring a story? Well, so how I did it is I introduced them to the concepts of uh, outcomes management. And really what an outcome is, is why we want a certain scope. So let's use this simple example here of we want a sustainable and resilient garden. So, you know, would improved access to gardening tools help us achieve that outcome? Yes, it probably would. So what scope? Well, we could start defining product features uh, about how we could have improved access to gardening tools. And maybe we could end up with something like this if the features we want are easy to maneuver, uh, to maneuver rather over varying terrain, having a seat, tools easy to access while sitting or standing and so on. Now, is that the only way we can get sustainable and a resilient garden? Well, what would improved irrigation also contribute to that? Probably true. What about sustainable organic fertilization? probably true. Would we get uh, a better outcome if we had all three? Probably. Would we get a portion of the outcome if we only had one? Yes. And so therein lies part of the, the issue is that when we don't know what we're trying to achieve, what outcome we're trying to get to, then in the traditional approaches, we jump straight to scope and we start trying to nail down the features of what we're going to have and we miss out on these other opportunities. And in some cases, this could lead us to make very different choices. Maybe we can't afford to build that cart. Maybe improved irrigation and sustainable organic fertilization is all we can afford. And this is what uncovers those possibilities. So even when you look at a single uh, 
outcome that precedes the ultimate outcome, you have lots of possible scopes. So how could you get improved irrigation? Here are some examples. So there's scopes can be different based on how we approach it. And even within a given how, there are, uh, is variance in the amount of scope we actually have to satisfy. And I believe it was Stuart mentioned on that, mentioned that earlier about being able to stop the contract or the work when enough value has been delivered. So this is kind of how you get to doing that. So it means we have a richer set of choices because there are many possible right answers to satisfy a given outcome. And, and that's the part that we really need to uh, try and uncover. So let's go back to building our plot around the story. So what this little diagram here is like a typical process model uh, and also how we look at projects is, you know, we're trying to get some output, the what, there's activity around it uh, and input. Now I call this, well, not I call this, this is the, the typical work breakdown structure, but I call this the PM's delusion. And most traditional project managers tend to focus on this. Most contracts tend to focus on this. Uh, and that's really a, a bit of a delusion because outcomes will happen whether you plan for them or not. And the issue is if we don't talk about the good and intended, the ones we actually intend, then we're never going to get them, which means all we can get are these, which means all we ever get from an outcomes perspective in most cases is the surprise. We get the good and intended stuff, unintended rather, and the bad and unintended. And, you know, why we want to talk about the good and intended stuff is that it helps us define why and the results we hope to get. There's a fourth one that I uh, came up with uh, a while ago, which was related to uh, the issue of cybersecurity. So this is where the bad guys uh, have their intent. So these are all different outcome types that can be talked about, can be described, uh, and we can work backwards to find out uh, what do those mean. So what output we need to achieve what outcome. So rather than, uh, so the arrow actually goes the other way. So how do we craft the story? So we started uh, with getting different people from around the organization and getting together in, in uh, different meetings and, and so on and talking about uh, what the, why they were doing what they were doing and we came up with an outcomes map. And as you can see, outcomes maps can be kind of messy and, and so on when they're being built and you can have some things that aren't connected yet but we kind of know we need to do it. Um, we also use a variant of the business model canvas, if you're familiar with that. And the, what we did there was to focus on the services that the learning and development group provided to the rest of the organization. So that's what that kind of filled in. So then we displayed those things in a public area and we kept iterating around them. And we put uh, a table with stickies and pens and so on. So as people walk by, uh, they could actually kind of make notes and things like this. Because one of the things we started to find was when people were in these meetings, uh, you know, what we talked about there, it would be a day or two later where, where they'd come back through emails and things like this and kind of say, hey, I thought about this and I forgot to tell you that. Uh, so this kind of helped us with that little issue. And, but it also, uh, it sort of leads to serendipity because as people are walking by and standing there and doing things uh, and looking at this, other people walk by and they have conversations. So it's a very visual thing. So that's, that's a useful thing. Um, there's different audiences for the kinds of things you come up with. So we, we try to sort of use different ways of describing the same things. So this is kind of a Coles Notes version of what we came up with. Uh, another one, uh, which is, th this one's kind of looking at it from a business capabilities perspective, and then value streams as to how you actually deliver on those capabilities. So the, the boxes are initiatives, uh, the circles, uh, our outcomes, the, the light green ones are the ultimate ones, the darker green ones are the uh, intermediate ones. Um, you also have to know who your story is for. Uh, so, and this kind of gets into, there's multiple different players uh, involved in what you're doing. And this was one of the things that we found was that uh, once we got into it, uh, we realized that, for example, there was a talent management component that wasn't being considered. Uh, so there were different uh, parts of even the HR organization uh, that had interest uh, and different perspectives on this. Uh, based on the services side of it, of what we came up with, they were able to come up with a services catalog. Uh, so that means the services they provided to the business previously were not the same ones that they needed to provide now. So that was a, a big change. 
Um, so what went into the LMS RFP? How did we decide that? So what we did is we looked at the capabilities that an LMS would provide and within each of the capability areas, we had them come up with capability statements and then we had them assign a business level of business value. And these are the, the, the numbers we used. And then we got them to look at within each of the capability areas and saying, well, if you only had a dollar and you had two capabilities that were ranked as a five, which one would you buy? And in some cases they go, well, they're both the same. So we'd say, okay, they stay as a five. Uh, in other cases say, well, this one's more important than that one. So we'd make it a four and, and we'd keep iterating until we got everything done and there was, uh, we got through it all. So then we kind of said, you know, the things that you say are very low or low business importance, uh, do you really want to put that into the RFP? And that's kind of how the organization ended up with the 246-page uh, RFP because they had a lot of very low and low importance uh, things. So we decided to take that out. So the RFP went out with only the very high, high and medium capabilities. Uh, so it's really only the stuff that had real business value. Within the, uh, the RFP itself, we asked the vendors to rank their products against the capabilities. So that, again, it was very simple, kind of black and white, is does your product do it out of the box? Is it st you know, standard tailoring with no code rewrite or programming, configuration with a partner, and so on. Um, so we had them kind of tell us, and there was no uh, uh, written uh, response. It was all electronic. So the high-level procurement process, 11 vendors invited, eight expressed interest, uh, three vendors responded. We did a 10 page RFP. This was the evaluation workflow. So that's really all the RFP document described. Uh, the process, we got everybody together uh, and validated the vendor self assessment or the individual team members rather spent a day doing the, the uh, self uh, vendor self assessments uh, and looking at that, coming up with their version of it. Then we got everybody together to get a team consensus on the self ratings. Uh, two of the three vendors that responded passed. We had them do a boardroom demo, and in the demo, uh, vendors one and two switched places, and days four and five were paperwork. One of the things we also considered, and uh, Alan sort of alluded to that, is we considered whether or not the vendor could work in an agile way, which is what we wanted to do. Uh, so going back to the, uh, cons the, the other parts of the story, uh, the architecture group uh, kind of reappeared at the end and says, well, you know, are you following our standards? Will this vendor uh, meet our architecture? And uh, this ended up causing a two-month delay until we got into a meeting on a Wednesday afternoon and we asked the question, you know, what were your architecture and IT standards 10 years ago? Are they, were they the same as they are today? And they said, no. We said, well, five years from now, will they be the same? We go, probably not. You go, well, what makes you think today is one of those pivot points? So here was the issue. Uh, well, actually, sorry, we had also the, the issue of the process police. And if you read the case study, you'll find out what I meant by that. Uh, so one of the things that we, we discovered, some of the things that we discovered is when the L&D business unit had a new higher purpose, uh, so they could, you know, uh, coalesce around their why, that's where we uncovered the new services and a new engagement model with the business. The, all the process stuff had changed, which, and all that led to a new org structure uh, afterwards. And the other interesting part is that the LMS actually wasn't the only tool that they had to procure. So we had to do multiple procurements. Uh, and so really, you know, it's not about IT and it's also uh, never just about procurement either. So uh, this and is what- Larry, I, I sincerely apologize, but just so we can get to our final speaker, yeah. we're gonna have yeah. to ask okay. you to wrap up in just a few seconds. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop right here. Uh, just a, the quick little thing. So the issue with the the architecture and standards was the back to the million dollars on the LMS is that would have caused us to spend the actual one million if we had uh, not been able to get past that issue. And instead of spending the one million, we ended up spending two and a half percent of the original budget for the LMS. So we actually delivered within the original time, the original money, and we also delivered a lot more. So I'll stop right there.